Today I'm going to show you what's inside of the Honda L15 engine and how it works. Now unlike the newer turbocharged L15 engines that are blowing up left and right, this one is a naturally aspirated version, a 1.5 liter 4 cylinder engine out of a 2012 Honda Fit and it's a lot more reliable. Now this one's got 288,000 kilometers on it, so we're going to tear it apart to see how it works. Taking a quick look around here, we do have a plastic valve cover and port injection. We do have a simple mechanical water pump and a mechanical thermostat. Around this side here you can see the four ignition coils and an integrated exhaust manifold which Honda is pretty famous for. Now this does use a single overhead camshaft with a timing chain and Honda's notoriously tight crank bolt. I'm going to start this teardown by removing these ignition coils. I bet I can probably take this whole engine apart with just 10s and 12s. Now the fuel rail is already loose, so let's see if we can pop that off. Oh, there's gas. The injectors stayed inside of there. Let's see how hard it is to get these injectors out. All right, let's get this valve cover off. Right, let's remove this valve cover. Now as you'd expect, the valve cover is pretty clean and it's actually simple. We just got one baffle over here and one PCV line that connects to it. Taking a look under the hood of this valve cover right away. This definitely could have benefited from a valve adjustment. That tapping noise would have made this engine quite loud, which you would adjust with this nut over here. Now on the intake side here, we do have VTEC, which is Honda's variable valve lift. And that has two rocker arms, one over here and one here, that control two different heights of cam profiles respectively. Now on the exhaust side, we just have a single rocker arm for each valve that follows the same cam profile. Also to note, this does not have variable valve timing because it's a single overhead camshaft. And over here on the intake side, is where the VTEC solenoid would mount up to. Now you don't have to remove this contraption here in order to get to the head bolts, which is nice, but I'm going to remove it anyway so we can take a look at that cool looking camshaft. I'll just pull this contraption off here. Underneath that VTEC contraption you can see we've got multiple cam profiles. These two outside ones here feed the exhaust side, while these two middle ones here are different heights and they feed the intake side. This one's lower than the other one, so if you just want more air at higher RPM, lock on to the middle one and you're going to get more power. Now if you want a more dedicated video on how VTEC itself works, check out my video linked above. Now this is as far as I can get on the top half of the engine and that's because this camshaft installs in this way into these bearing surfaces as opposed to having cam caps therefore I need to take the chain off and slide it out and to do that I gotta take the cover off and that crank bolt I don't know why they always make these things so hard to get up wait never mind so I broke this crank bolt free by sticking something in the flywheel before I put this on the engine stand so I luckily don't have to deal with that so we'll just take this off here All right, let's start on the accessories by getting the water pump out All right, I wonder how much coolant is actually in here. Oh, there's coolant. And it's green Honda coolant, which is great. While we're on the subject of cooling, let's get the thermostat housing on. Very typical thermostat. Very crusty as well. Let's get this coolant manifold off where it goes into the head. This engine is so crusty, it needs encouragement for everything. So now I can probably pull this off here. Yeah, this is always a tricky connection. It could either leak or it's really stuck and rusted. So that's the coolant temperature sensor stuck in there. We've got a line that goes off to either the heater core or the throttle body. And this here is where the thermostat will live. It's bypassed from the water pump going back over to the head of the block. All right, we're going to up it now to a 12 millimeter socket as I take off this tensioner. And now I'm going to take off all the bolts with the front timing cover. All right, let's see if we can pry this off. Now notice this doesn't have an inspection port for the tensioner. And of course this being a Honda, it's a very simple engine design. First of all you got the oil pump at the bottom here which is direct drive, there's no chains going to it. There's only a single chain that goes from the crankshaft up to the camshaft. There's no variable valve timing, there's no intake and exhaust, just one to one. Now in terms of the tensioner, it looks like this piece here is stationary. You got a bit of a leaf spring design in behind here with plastic slides on both sides. So let's take this thing apart and take a closer look. It is a leaf spring. That's cool. Now this tensioner is not hydraulic, it's just a fixed piece that pushes up against this piece over here. Once those two bolts line up, that sets your tension. All of the tension is in this leaf spring over here, as you can see as I make it nice and tight. That's what keeps the chain tension, so I can relax that a bit. Okay, Take this off. Look at that tiny little timing chain slide, it's so thin. Now there's no tension on the camshaft because we took off the VTEC apparatus. So I can go ahead and safely remove that. Look at this chain, it's so tiny. Something you'd probably wear around your neck. Just slap this back on here and see if I can knock this bolt free. This one's a 14. There we 
go, take that off. This is your gear, very simple, no variable valve timing at all. Nothing to go wrong there, very reliable. So I guess you do need more than a 10 and a 12 to take this off. This is a six mil hex. Well, at least this tensioner side is a lot wider. All right, so this design with the leaf spring is pretty cool. It's got a metal back leaf spring inside of there. What I don't like is that the hard points are made of plastic, but this is a very low stress engine anyway. I don't expect this to be the main failure point. I think it's a lot more foolproof than the earlier B and D series of Honda engines that had that cam that you'd have to push in and check if the belt was tight. This is a lot more robust. Now this one's got a key here, which is separate. It's not machined onto the crankshaft and we can take off that gear. So now I'm going to rotate this engine around. See how much oil is inside. Now the head bolts on these are a measly 12 millimeter socket. At least they're not some fancy spline socket. That's a measly little noodle of a bolt. That's what's holding your engine head together. All right, let's see if I can get this head off. Now the head gasket on this is a three layer steel and it looks fine. I don't see any breaches. This was a running engine. However, when you start to look at the condition inside this engine, things are not looking all that great. We do have a bit of carbon buildup on the pistons as you'd expect. There are some vertical scratches here that look like rust marks. Uh, inside of here, I wiped this one off, but you can still see the cross hatching is not that great. And as you can see at the edges here, there are steel liners instead of here, as you can see by the rust. It's not just the coating like newer engines. I'm gonna rotate this engine over. Oh my God, it does not feel good. Feels very sticky. Yeah, looking inside of here, you can see there's a lot of crumbs in here. The intake was left open sitting outside for a while. If I use my son's bib here and try to wipe up some of this stuff here, you can see that the cross hatching inside of there is not ideal. It is definitely a high mileage engine. This one's got a bit of sludge sitting at the bottom here. A bit of carbon and rust. And the crust continues here on the bottom of the intake valves here. These ones were probably left open when this engine was sitting. At least the oil quality inside of here looks pretty clean. If you are going to be starting an engine that's been sitting for a while, you might want to soak it with a solution that would clean off some of this crust. It's really nice that they point out the word engine oil on here. And I'm going to remove this oil pan in typical Honda fashion. It is a cast aluminum piece. Let's do that. Make a mess. No mess. At least they give you places to pry. Pop this guy off here. Wow, it looks pretty clean. Oh, I gotta say for a high-ish mileage engine, it looks pretty clean. There's only a few grums inside of there, but that's to be expected. Here you can see we've got the inlet and outlet for the oil filter, which is actually located on this pan itself as opposed to the block. Next up, I'm gonna be removing the oil pickup tube. I always get bolts in these teardowns, but I never get nuts, so I gotta save those. Very simple piece and I don't see any crumbs or anything inside of there. Now the bottom end is got this ladder frame design as opposed to having separate bearings. Now these use 14 millimeter bolts. So do you guys think that my impact can take this off? It's just below freezing in here and these tools don't do very good. Oh, we got two bolts going into the oil pump here. Might as well have just taken out the whole oil pump first pop off the oil pump. Very simple direct drive oil pump. Since you've got oil coming in here from the pickup tube and exiting over here to go directly into the block and this is likely a gear style oil pump. All right now let's see if I can get this bottom ladder off. Only Honda gives you these nice pry points. So contrary to the belief these caps here are actually removable from this nice sturdy ladder frame just like this. And I looked at all the bearings and they actually look in pretty decent shape for a high mileage engine. I think Honda did a pretty good job with this version of the L15. So much for these fasteners being easy. These are the last set on the connecting rod caps and they have a socket that I don't need, which is an eight millimeter 12 point socket. So I do have a wrench that's eight millimeter and it's got a 12 point socket on the end there. So watch me struggle as I try to get this loose. Now they're loose, I'll just use a regular 10 mil and zip that off. Connecting rod cap. Wow, look at that bearing. It looks beautiful. And now I'm going to pop these pistons down. Take out these connecting rod caps. Pop these rod bearings off. I got to say, for 285,000 kilometers and no scratches on it, this is pretty good. I'm going to pop these two pistons down. 
Pop the rear seal off, and then I can pull out the crankshaft. Well, we know Honda makes really good engines, or at least they used to before all the turbocharging stuff. So let's take a closer look at some of these components. And as you saw, the goal of all these components is simplicity equals reliability. Starting even at the crankshaft here, very simple design, nice large lubrication holes for it to lubricate both the main bearings and the crankshaft bearings. The counterweights on here are actually a reasonable size for a 1.5 liter engine. Overall, this thing feels pretty hefty. Could probably take a little more boost, you know? Looking at the pistons here, you can see they are a little bit more crusty. The wrist pins are a little bit on the stiffer side. The oil control rings there do appear to be clogged with a little bit of carbon, indicating this was a high mileage engine and probably burned a little bit of oil. Even the original polka dots on the side here mean that they didn't really see too much skirt wear either. Looking at the lubrication system, very simple oil pump, doesn't have any extra chains or anything. Oil in, oil out, goes straight into the block over here to this hole. This hole is gonna go into the pan where it's gonna get filtered out and sent back in through this hole over here. That hole is then gonna correspond with an oil galley that's drilled across the length of the block here. That's what's gonna feed all of the crankshaft bearings as well as the connecting rod bearings through the crankshaft. There are no piston oil squirters in this one to help with cooling and lubrication. Instead, you could see there's these little notches on the connecting rod itself that'll help spray some of that oil upward to help cool that cylinder liner. Now teeing off of that main oil galley is our oil feed that's gonna go to the head at the interface of the head gasket. And instead of here, you can see there is a piece of plastic that sits in there. Now as you can see, it's also an open deck design, very good for cooling. This is a low power engine, so you don't really need to have supports in between here. So the PCV system is integrated in the block over here, just behind the starter, with this being the PCV valve. So let's take off these turns and take a look. As you can see, oily air is going to come up from the crankcase as those pistons move up and down and be passed through this baffle system over here, hopefully allowing the oil to settle and drain back down into the sump. Usually that doesn't happen though. And then it's going to exit over here where we have the PCV system. This has a little check ball inside, which once again, hopefully does not allow oily air to enter the intake, but oftentimes it does. Now the cooling system in this engine is very straightforward. We've got the water pump that sits over here on the block, which is the same size and shape as something I'm very familiar with. It looks like this. These use metal impellers, which will be nice and sturdy. And it's driven off of the serpentine belt and not no timing belt like older Hondas. And that's going to pump coolant directly into the cooling jacket on the block. And then of course on the back side we had that pipe with the thermostat and its bypass. It goes over to the coolant sensor and the coolant hoses that go to warm up the cabin. Taking a look at the head here, very simple. We have coolant that's going to come from the block around the valves here and exit out this way to be recirculated. Condition of these valves are a bit crusty, but this didn't have an intake on it, so it's very likely moisture got inside. What's also pretty cool about Hondas is that they integrate the manifold into the head casting itself. There's also this extra bore on the side here for what looks like an EGR system. That bore leads up to this other side here, where I'm sure the intake bolts up to and sucks all that oily air back into the intake. Look at how clean those valves are. That's one of the benefits of having port injection. You can keep everything nice and clean and not have to open it up every so often to clean it out. Perhaps the most complicated thing on this engine is the VTEC system. Essentially, we've got oil that's gonna feed the head for lubrication. That's gonna be chamfered off here to the VTEC solenoid. And that in turn is going to bring oil up inside of this assembly here where we have the rocker arm assembly. I'm gonna remove this end cap here where the camshaft is. It hurts extra when it's cold outside. So that tab just broke off and just like my fingers, it's hurting pretty bad. All right, so I was able to beat that cover off. Now the cam sensor is located at the top here. All right, now I can get that cam sensor out of there. And here's the camshaft. So a quick rundown on how VTEC works. Here we've got the two cam lobes on the exhaust side that power those two. They've got the same cam profile and timing, but on the intake side here, you can see how this one is higher than this one. Now, normally when you're working along, you'd be locked to this lower one over here, but when you want a little bit more power, you'd switch to this cam gear here. That would in turn push the valve down a little bit further so you can get a little bit more air in there and add some fuel and you've got therefore a little bit more power. Now in some other Hondas, the tip of this would also change to either advance or retard the timing depending on what type of VTEC it is. But in this case, the tips are in the same timing to each other. It's just that this cam lobe is higher. So essentially when VTEC kicks in, you know, the oil is gonna travel through this rocker arm system here. The two exhaust ones on the outside are just free to rotate along their cams. The intake ones here is where the oil is gonna go. Now normally when there's no oil pressure, one is actually gonna be following the lower cam profile and one follows the tall cam profile. When you want more power, you'd lock both of these together in the same position and then they'd both be 
be following the larger cam profile. So if you look at how this locks together, there's a little pin over here. And when the oil pressure pushes up against it, it causes the two of these to lock together over here. And then they both can ride the same cam profile together. In addition to the valve spring, this one's got an extra spring at the back here. And this looks quite complicated for an economy engine, but Honda's pioneered VTEC for many, many years. And it has been proven very reliable with the exception of the filter screen that often gets clogged in these solenoids. And that's a look inside of Honda's L15 engine and how it works. I think it's a very robustly designed and should be a reliable engine for years to come. I do look forward in tearing down the L15 turbocharged variant that we find in the current Accords, Civics and CRVs because they've done a lot of modification to this platform in order to make turbocharging work. Make sure you subscribe if you want to see more videos just like this one.